<clears throat> Matthew chapter 9 is where we are. We've, it's been a couple weeks since we were in Matthew. We had meditations on our Lord and King Jesus in his kingly position. And we had meditations on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ on the 17th. I always look forward to those times, very sacred time, Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday, uh, the Passion Week. But we're back in Matthew now, walking through the book of Matthew and some very important uh, truths that we're going to look at today. So I hope you are tuned in, listening, because if you miss today's point, uh, you've missed something that will have consequences, like we talked about in Sunday school. Matthew chapter 9, verse 1, and he entered into a ship and passed over. Now, if you remember, he left the country of the Gadarenes and the maniac of Gadara that was heal, healed and cured and all the swine that were drowned. And um, so he entered into a ship and passed over the Sea of Galilee and came into his own city. Where would that be? That's Capernaum. That's where his headquarters were. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy lying on a bed. As you remember, we have already covered this story because we were talking about Peter and Peter's house and being a ministry headquarters and what happens when that happens. Your house takes a beating and, and uh, things happen. You, I mean, your family has to realize that there's going to be some late nights. There's going to be uh, laying down your life for the cause when you have your home as a ministry headquarters. So this story, if you find it in Mark chapter two, tells the details that this guy was carried by four men. They couldn't get into the house. They went up on top, broke up the roof there, and let him down through in front of Jesus. We, we covered that. But the scribes and Pharisees, when they heard Jesus, Jesus looked at this man and he said, uh, son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Man, behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemeth. What is blasphemy? Blasphemy is either slanderously misrepresenting God, speaking evil of God, but it also includes usurping something to myself that only belongs to God, claiming to be or do something that only God can be or do, and that is also considered blasphemy because uh, of usurpation. Now, Jesus here, knowing their thoughts, said, wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Well, he just read their mind. That's something only God could do, right? And whether it's easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, then saith he to the sick of the palsy, arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. So they said he's blaspheming. Why? Because he's declaring he can do something that only God can do. And then he proceeded to do two things that only God can do in front of their eyes, in front of their face. So immediately they changed their minds, right? Wrong. The scribes didn't change their minds. And we'll see this as it goes on. The reason he ended up being crucified is because these scribes and Pharisees who charged him with blasphemy never changed their minds. Now, maybe there might have been one or two of them, but the group, the whole, the, the, the ones who were set against him, they, they could not change their minds. Now, I want you to hold that thought. We're going to revisit that later on, and I'm going to tell you why. Their minds, immediately they didn't say, oh, Oh, well, maybe he is God. Maybe it's not blasphemy. No, they didn't do that. And I'm going to share with you why in a little bit. But I'm going to ask another question. It says the people marveled and glorified God. Did they marvel and glorify God because the man's sins were forgiven? Or did they marvel and glorify God because he rose up and walked? You find the disciples coming back from a preaching tour telling Jesus, Lord, even the devils were subject unto us through thy name. And what did Jesus say to him at that point? 
He said, Rejoice not that the devils are subject unto you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now, what would you rather hear about? Would you rather hear a story about us casting out a devil? Or would you rather hear that this is how you can have your name written in heaven? Is a problem with our earthly values, and it's due to weak faith. Because which one was the greater power? To forgive that man's sins or to heal his the paralytic condition? Which was infinitely and eternally more important to that man? Which one is more important to you? Which one consumes more of your time? And which one consumes more of your money? Which one consumes more of your thoughts? Which one awes and, and, and makes you marvel more? We need to think about that. We, we need to realize how far we are from really having God's values in our own hearts and minds by those simple things that we don't value the way he values. I can tell you, you know, one reason why people aren't concerned about getting their doctrine accurate with the Bible. Because I, I've spoken to them and they're more concerned about keeping their group together, not making waves, trying to keep their, their, their community, their Christian congregation, their community together, than really being willing to make waves over doctrine. You know why? Because they don't see the forgiveness of their sins as valuable as their present comfort and brotherhood success and so forth. We well, say, brother, they, they don't see that as a mattering with the forgiveness of their sins. Why? Why don't you see having proper doctrine connected to the forgiveness of your sins? That's another bad doctrinal issue that is sunk into your mind. This once pray a prayer, once saved, always saved. You know, it doesn't matter if you believe right as long as you're sincere. All of that is deceptions of, of the grievous wolves crept in unawares. Getting your doctrine straight and being tenacious about worshiping God properly, doing church properly, believing properly, understanding the Bible properly, all of that has to do with valuing the forgiveness of my sins over these earthly things that we think are so important. Let's go on, verse 9. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. He was sitting at a toll booth. He was collecting taxes for the government. Mark and Luke tell us that this man was also called Levi. It's interesting that Matthew doesn't use his more lofty family name of Levi. He uses a lesser name of Matthew. Um, and Mark says he was the son of Alphaeus, which is also the same as the name Cleophas in the Bible, or Clopas, okay? Same person. Now, I say it's the same name. We don't know for sure if there was only one Alphaeus in the Bible or if there was more than one. But if there was only one, and they say he was the son of Alphaeus, it is like he didn't say he was the son of an, of an Alphaeus. He was the son of Alphaeus, okay? That it seems to intimate that we're talking about the same guy that all of you should know who this guy is, the receivers of this gospel. You, you, you know who this guy is. Well, if indeed there was only one, then he was also the brother, then Matthew was the brother of James the less and Joseph. And if this Alphaeus was the same one, uh, then he was also um, on the road to Damascus. Matthew's father was the one on the road, not to Damascus, to Emmaus. Matthew's father would have been the one on the road to Emmaus with most likely Luke. So uh, Matthew, he, he comes, he says here, He's sitting at the receipt of custom, and Jesus saith unto him, Follow me, and he arose and followed him. Now, that is Matthew's way of presenting the call of Peter, James, and John as well. He was walking by the sea. They were mending their nets. He said, Follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. They left and followed him. But what we know from the book of John is Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, and Nathaniel, and all of them, they had met Jesus already. Um, they knew who he, they had already believed that he was the Messiah to some degree. And so when he calls them away from their fishing nets, he's calling them to follow him on a preaching tour, okay? And they left and followed him on that preaching tour. We don't know the exact details here. 
there's a couple different possibilities that are interesting. Uh, we know that when Jesus said, follow me to Matthew, immediately afterwards, Matthew is having a feast in his home and inviting all of his fellow tax collectors. So was this just a ministry project that Jesus said, follow me, and he got up and followed him and said, look, I want you to invite all your tax collectors to your house, have a feast, I want to talk to them. That's a possibility. Or was it so that Matthew, uh, if he was indeed the brother of James and Joseph, that he knew about Jesus, but he was a tax collector. The Jews looked upon him as dirt, okay? They looked upon him as, as just, you're a tax collector for the government. We don't like you. But Zacchaeus was a tax collector as well. And Zacchaeus was accepted by Jesus when he repented of his sin. He did not cease to be a tax collector. Being a tax collector, as much as we don't want to accept this, is not sin, okay? <laughs> as much as we don't like those people, being a tax collector is not sin. It's actually a part of rendering to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And it was not sinful to be a tax collector if you did it honestly, which is where Zacchaeus repented. He said, Lord, if I've taken anything fraudulently, I'm going to restore them fourfold. And the half of my goods I'm going to give to the poor. And Jesus said, today is salvation come to this man's house. All right. So uh, Matthew being a tax collector wasn't necessarily sinful. And the reason I'm saying this is because if you stop and use common sense and, and look at the whole Bible, Jesus never chose a person of ill repute to be an apostle. Jesus was choosing men who were going to carry on his work after he died. He chose the cream of the crop. He chose the very best Israelites fitted for that purpose and trained them. You say, well, uh, can, you, can you give us an illustration of that? I can. Zacchaeus did not become an apostle. The maniac of Gadara wanted to be with Jesus. He did not become an apostle. The ones that Jesus chose to be an apostle follow the Bible's own requirements for being a bishop. He must have a good report of them that are without. I don't believe Matthew, as, as commentators like to put him, oh, he was a, he was a sinner that God, God saved. Well, he was a sinner like we're all a sinner, but he did not, he was not a man of ill repute, okay? He did not have a bad reputation. He was not previously fraudulent, uh, in my opinion, because of the circumstances. Jesus followed his own rules in choosing people for important positions who had a good report of them that are without, right? He set the example. So Matthew, it's very likely that Matthew just assumed because of the way Jews treated uh, tax collectors, that Matthew assumed, even though he wanted to be a part, that Jesus wouldn't want him to be a part. That's possible. And here Jesus comes by and says, I want you to be a part. That would be really something for Matthew. He may have thought, well, I'd like to be a part of this. I'd like to, you know, follow along. I'd like to be, you know, with Jesus and be a, a, used, but he probably don't want me. I'm a tax collector. Jesus said, no, I want you. Don't, Jesus was concerned about what was real sin, not just what people didn't like. You know, we have, we have social taboos that come along and sometimes we, we make our own categories and we make our own standards and we assume that we're right after all because, you know, God must agree with us, but that's not always the case. We need to get in tune with what God says and what God thinks and not just what we assume. The Jews were good about assuming what they perceived as holy and unholy. It wasn't always that way. And we're going to see that as we go along here. Verse 10, and it came to pass as Jesus sat at me in the house. This is Matthew's house, okay? Matthew made a feast and he invited all uh, all his fellow tax collectors. Now that could be because he realized that Jesus was not partial in this regard. And Jesus may have told him, look, I, wanna, I want you to have a feast. I want you to invite all your tax collector uh, fellow workers, everyone you know, they will come to your feast and I want to talk to him. 
Uh, that was totally non-conventional Judaism, okay? We are reaching out to tax collectors. That's not the Jewish thing to do. Not if you were a Pharisee or a scribe or, you know, that's just, Jesus was doing that. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Now, did Jesus go to the sinner's party? Uh, did he go to, when they were having a tailgate -ish, uh, you know, party uh, before the ball game, did he go in there and just try to be, try to meet them on their ground? No, that's not what happened. Okay, a lot of people say, well, Jesus ate with sinners. Just like he went down to the bar and he sat there and talked to them, you know, and, and no. Jesus was the holy son of God. He was a godly rabbi, but he did want to reach sinners, but he didn't go where the sinners were having their deal and accept what they were doing. He called them to a forum, to a situation that he established, which was godly. Okay, he, was, he did not go uh, to the sinner's beer bash to reach out to sinners. You know, Brother Mark, that's kind of obvious. That's not obvious to everybody. I know a lot of people, I know a lot of people who teach and believe that if Jesus were here today, he wouldn't be in church, he'd be down there at the bar trying to witness the, no, he wouldn't. On the Sabbath, Jesus was keeping the Sabbath. At the feast, he was at the feast. At the, when it was time to go to synagogue, he was at the synagogue. He didn't go to the bar where the, the wicked were. You look at that in the, the life of the apostles. Paul went to Corinth. Corinth was the Las Vegas of Achaia. He went there, but he didn't go to the, the temple of Delphi. He didn't go to the many wine shops in Corinth, there was many of them because it was a sailor town, okay? Uh, it was a big commerce town. He didn't go to the wine shops. Paul went to the synagogue because that's where the people who are concerned about spiritual things would be, and that's who he wanted to talk to. Now, obviously, if there had been an opportunity to talk to someone in the market, he went to the market. He didn't go to the wine shop, though. He went to the market and conversed with people. It's different. And so we don't need to try and bring Jesus down to our standard of evangelism. We need to get in tune with his standard of evangelism. But still, in the Jews' mind, this was not acceptable. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? That was, that was taboo on their list. But it wasn't taboo on God's list. Okay? If Jesus had gone to where the publicans and sinners were having a beer party and a rock party and so forth and sat down and joined into that, that was bad on God's list. But that's not what happened here. Understand, Matthew uh, was an uh, upright man or he would have never become an apostle. Matthew made a feast and invited these people to his home to meet Jesus. That's totally different. And that's what we should be doing is reaching out to people in an appropriate way. Uh, we, we never have to be inappropriate or ungodly or hurt our testimony to reach out to uh, sinners, okay? There is a proper way to do it. Jesus did it the proper way, regardless of what the, the Jews thought. But when Jesus heard that, what did he say? He said unto them, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. So here's Jesus's purpose not to just relate to them, not to just uh, make, make them think he's a good guy. They were coming to the doctor, and the doctor was doing surgery. The doctor was trying to heal the sick, and he spoke it openly. He was not ashamed to let these people know that I'm the doctor, they're sick, and that's why they're here. He didn't try to hide it from them. Uh, the Pharisees had prejudices that blinded them to loving the lost. It blinded them to reaching out to sinners. It blinded them to truly trying to help people. And they would rather judge Jesus' efforts to reach the lost than learn from him. And we're, there, there's that concept again that we're going to revisit a number of times in this chapter. Why didn't they change their mind when they called him a blasphemer and then he proved that he wasn't? Why didn't they change their mind? Why couldn't they learn from him here? It, 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 it shows up again. God's law of love 
God will not change his standard for anybody because he knows it's perfect. It's never changed. Jesus did not do anything that was new as far as God was concerned, as far as his law was concerned. Okay? There is nothing new because God's perfect eternity past, eternity future. God doesn't come up with a new ethic or a new a thought that he never had before. God's perfection is eternal in both directions. So, God's law of love was perfectly epitomized in Jesus Christ, demonstrated in Jesus Christ. But that came in conflict with the contemporary ideas of religiosity of the day. And if Jesus came to this world now, or the apostles, and truly demonstrated God, it would rub some things in our lives that we have assumed the wrong way. It'd make us realize, oh, we had a misconception here or there. It would do that to every single religious group some more and some less in the world because we would realize that we are not perfectly synchronized with God's idea on everything and we would have to adjust to get in line with that. The problem is some people don't like to adjust. Listen to Jesus' answer. Verse 13, But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Go learn what that means. He's talking to scribes, fairy. He's talking to the Jewish lawyers, the Jewish doctors. Go learn what that means. It's a little verse in the Old Testament. Do you know what it means? Do you know where it's at? Hosea 6.6 6 says, For I desired mercy and not sacrifice. Jesus said, Go learn what that means. They were probably thinking, do you know what it means? The reason this is important is because this was a key to what Jesus was really doing and why he was doing it, what he was thinking and why he was thinking it. This was, this was what he gave to them as an answer to their religious criticism. Go learn what that means. Well, that's very important to us to learn, isn't it? For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. This goes together. This is a Hebraism. It's a, a phrase that's repeated differently, but it means the same thing. And they repeat it in a different way to give you a more full knowledge of what he's talking about. I desired that my mercy, visualized in the sacrificial ceremonies of Judaism, that me having mercy on you would enter your hearts and you would be partakers of my love and my mercy and my character, and you would be transformed to be like me. I desired that more than just the mere sacrifice, the ceremony, walking through the ceremony. And he says, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. So this mercy, I desired my people to be like me more than just to go through the religious motions. I'm going to read you some other verses that follow that same idea. 1 Samuel 15, 22, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Proverbs 21, 3, To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Now, the sacrifices, mind you, was his idea, his commandment, his program. But it wasn't so we could have something religious to do while we went along our carnal way. He was trying to teach us about his plan of redemption and how we can reconcile with God. And it has a lot more to do with our heart than it does with the, the, the object lesson he gave us. To do justice and judgment, he says here. He said, well, Brother Mark, the other one said mercy. There's absolutely no conflict there. God is not 50% mercy and 75% justice and whatever. Okay, God is all mercy, all justice, all judgment. You know why? Because without God's justice, 
mercy would not be appropriate. It takes justice and judgment to make mercy appropriate and grace appropriate. They all are the same. They're all bound up in God's perfect, appropriate love. So judgment, when it's appropriate, is love and mercy. And mercy, when it's appropriate, is justice and judgment. It's all God's uh, application of perfect appropriateness, which the Bible calls love. Psalm 51, 16, David knew, for thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Now we know David offered sacrifices. But what he's saying here is I realize that is just a peripheral part of this. What you really want is a broken contrite. You want the sacrifice of my being, not just animal blood. Isaiah 64, 6, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. You say, Brother Mark, how does that fit with the other verses? I'll tell you how. Because this verse has been probably the most abused verse in the Bible for the Calvinistic antinomian nonsense. All our righteousnesses, replace that word with sacrifices. All our religious ceremonies, all our sacrifices are as filthy rags when in the same time our iniquities, our lawlessness have taken us away. Has God as great a delight in righteousnesses as in the knowledge of the Lord? Okay, so that's, that's what that verse is dealing with the same concept. Here's another one. 1 Corinthians 13, 1, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, God's love, God's mind, God's values. I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. Why? Because God's the, the, the sacrifices, the ceremonies, the fasting, the prayer, the alms, all commanded by God. But when they are exercised without the heart of God, the mind of God, the purpose of God, the values of God, they are meaningless and actually work against God. Jesus said, if you gather not with me, you scatter abroad. And so he said, go learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And if I could add on to the end of that, I would say, and your ideas about religion are in the way. And your ideas about religion are working against me. So go learn what that means and quit. Start, you need to start learning from my evangelism instead of criticizing my evangelism. Isn't that what he was saying? They were, what's he, what's he doing having a feast and inviting a bunch of tax collectors here for? We don't, we don't consider that holy. We don't consider that righteous. We, that's, not, that's not okay in, in our idea of Judaism. And Jesus said, I didn't come. I didn't come to endorse your idea of Judaism. Then came the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast off, but thy disciples fast not? Here's some disciples of John that also were plagued with this same idea of what's acceptable in Judaism. And if you're going to be a disciple of a rabbi, then you have to have a certain amount of days and program of fasting. That's just what disciples of rabbis do. And why aren't you doing that? This is what it takes to be a good Jew in their mind, and you're not, you don't seem to be living up to our idea of a good Jew. And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn? What was fasting? Fasting was mourning. Oh, you mean there's a purpose behind it? There's actually, it's, it's not just a religious thing to do to make me look good in the eyes of all my religious friends, but there's actually a reason why people fast and there's a purpose and when that purpose is not appropriate it's not appropriate to fast 
Appropriate things are only appropriate when they're done in appropriate times, in appropriate ways, and for appropriate reasons. Otherwise, you're just going through mechanical motions because that's the thing to do. And Jesus said, can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them and then shall they fast. A true disciple wants to know why God does what he does and says what he says so they can make sure they're appropriately applying it. That's very important. Now listen to what Jesus says. His illustration of appropriateness, and this is vital to the whole line of thought this morning. No man put a piece of new cloth onto an old garment. For that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Okay, what he's saying is, if you take a piece of unfold, it's what the, that's actually the Greek word, the untreated, the unwashed wool or, or material that they had, and you sewed it to patch a hole in a garment that had already been treated and washed a few times, then when this new cloth, this raw cloth, got wet and washed, it would shrink. And it would tear away and make the rent worse. Because the old fabric was not, was not going to stretch. Okay? The old fabric could not stretch, and so it would be torn. Remember that, okay? Jesus was God coming in contact with man's ideas of serving God. They were stuck in their personal ideas. Jesus, in showing up with God's mind on everything, God's view on everything, God's way to do everything, expected them to stretch and conform to truth. As truth came their way, he wanted them to conform to that truth and change their ideas and adjust their thinking and modify their opinions to fit truth. But they couldn't stretch. Okay, let's go on. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break and the wine runneth out. We're talking about wine skins. We think of bottles, we think of glass. This is wine skins, okay? And the bottles perish, but they put new wine into new wine skins, and both are preserved. Why? Because the new wine skin can stretch to make uh, appropriate room for the fermenting wine. The old wine skin has a problem. It's set, and it will not stretch. It will not give without ripping and rupturing and being destroyed. The old cloth could not stretch and conform. It would just tear apart. God wants to fill men with his law, his love, his wisdom, his truth. But some are so welded to their prejudices, they will not be corrected, they will not be changed, they would rather be destroyed than be altered. The Pharisees charge Jesus with blasphemy rather than stretch. The Pharisees cannot accept Jesus eating with tax collectors and reaching out to lost souls because they couldn't stretch. The disciples of John had a hard time with Jesus challenging the status quo, the religious norm, because they had a hard time adjusting. Did they, did they not acknowledge him as the Messiah? Then there should be no resistance Peter, after being broken, was made into a new bottle, okay? And when God let down that sheet from heaven and said, rise, Peter, slay and eat, even though he thought this is totally against law, I can't, I can't do this, this is against God's law, I don't know what God's trying to tell me. When God then, when he, under, when he got it, when he understood it, and he went into Cornelius' house, and Cornelius explained to him what happened, he said, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. And then when he saw the Spirit poured out, he said, who can forbid water that these should not be baptized? That was a stretch. 
That was a major stretch on Peter's thoughts the week before. But because Peter had become a new wineskin, he had, he had uh, uh, yielded and broken his heart before God and repented and just given up his ideas, he was able to be stretched and conformed to God's purposes, God's way, God's viewpoint without being destroyed by it. Now, there were, there were many who could not. There were many who would not stretch. And uh, <clears throat> in Acts 22, 22, we have the Apostle Paul. He's standing on the stairs leading up to the, the castle of Antonia. He's there with the Roman soldiers. He asked to speak to the people. The people are all there, the, the whole group of Jews. He begins to speak to them in Hebrew. They listen. And they, he came to one point, and you might as well set off the dynamite. He said, God told me, they will not hear your witness. I'm going to send you far hence unto the Gentiles. And you saw a bunch of wineskins rupturing right there. Right before your eyes, they were ripping and rupturing because they would not accept that if God himself had spoken from heaven, they had still ruptured. You can get so set and proud of your opinion and set in your ways and set on your ideas that you will rupture before you will conform to the truth of God. We're going to see this one again, once again. Let's go on. Verse 18. While well, he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him. Now, if you read in Luke, you'll find this man's name was Jairus. He was a ruler of the synagogue, and he came to Jesus while he was at the feast in Matthew's house, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. And if you know the story from Luke, you'll know that actually the daughter was not dead at that time. Matthew is just giving you the highlight. Luke gives you the details of how this came about. Actually, the man's daughter was not dead yet. But while, while he was waiting on Jesus to heal this woman who had an issue of blood and find out who touched him and talk about it, a servant came running from his house and said, your daughter's dead, don't trouble the master. And Jesus said, only believe. And he, he, he hung on those words. But it says here, Matthew, just, he just skims through and gives us the, the main point. And there, behold, there a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Now, if you know the Bible, you know that actually he turned around and said, Who touched me? Remember? Okay, so we don't have all the detail here. Different apostles gave us different details. And all that proves is the much more valuable witness because they're not in collusion. They didn't have a standard uh, narrative that they all passed out and everybody followed. They had their own personal eyewitness. Um, that he said, thy faith hath made thee whole, and the woman was made whole from that hour. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise, he said unto them, give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand, and the maid arose. And the fame hereof went abroad into all that land. I want you to notice three things quickly. Number one, this man was a ruler of the synagogue. He was not just a poor, ignorant Jew. He was a ruler of the synagogue. He believed the reports of Jesus. This gives great uh, credence to the fact that this was, it was well known. Okay? But not only that, he was a ruler of the synagogue in where? In Capernaum. He knew about Jesus for a while. He had heard about the, the healings, you know, the, the nights at Peter's house. Jesus is back in town. The people find out he's back in town. So they all run around and gather up all the sick people and bring them to Peter's house. The, the ruler of the synagogue obviously knew about that. And no doubt Jesus had taught in that synagogue numerous times. Why did it take him so long to come and fall down before Jesus? It says he worshiped him. That means he fell prostrate before him. He fell down before him and begged him. That man was desperate. I don't know the details, but do we have to be desperate before we come to Jesus? What, 
what went through this man's mind? What if this gets back to the chief priest? What if it gets back to Annas and Caiaphas? What if this gets back to, you know, I'm the ruler of the synagogue. I've got jurisdiction here. What's going to happen if I go down and, and beg Jesus to help me? Is that why he waited till the girl was on her last breath? She died before he even got Jesus back to the house? I want you to notice number two. Jesus was so in control, there was no need to hurry. If, if you're a first responder, you got to hurry. If you're Jeremiah here working on the ambulance, EMT stuff, okay? Hurry is a big word, right? Time is everything. With Jesus, there was, there was no rush. And that little girl's father probably was really having a hard time with that. Especially when the servant came up and said, don't trouble the master anymore, she's already dead. Can you imagine being that man? Mary and Martha knew Jesus very well, but Martha came out and said, Lord, if you'd been here. But Jesus tarried a couple more days where he was when he heard about it. What control? No hurry, no stress, because there was nothing he couldn't solve. Now I want you to notice number three. There's a significance here, but we don't really know exactly what it is. How is it that this girl was 12 years old and this woman had an issue of blood 12 years? Don't you think there's got to be some significance there? Well, we know that Israel was 12 tribes, so I'm going to throw something out. Maybe we'll ask Jesus someday, was this a type? God, God usually does things and he kills three birds with one stone, you know? So you have a type of Israel in the number 12. If Israel would just stop thronging Jesus and reach out and touch him as Messiah, Israel could have been healed from their, they were hemorrhaging as a nation. And if Israel's religious leaders who could not heal Israel, would have fallen down before Jesus. Israel could have been healed. I'm going to ask Jesus someday if I got close. How many homes and churches and nations are just like that? Verse 27. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. And as they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with the devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake, and the multitude marveled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils to the prince of the devils. Really? They said it was never so seen in Israel. Well, the devil had been around a long time. These men that we have seen, these Pharisees, scribes that keep showing up here, the doctors of the law, epitomize the old garment and the old wineskins. And when God comes, Jesus, he could not have used these men. He could not have made apostles out of these men because they could not stretch. If you're going to be used of God, it's going to stretch you. It's going to make you have to change the form you're in to meet a different form. You're going to have to conform to the image of Christ. Christ is going to have to be formed in you. And that means you're going to have to stretch. When it comes to changing what you assumed was right doctrine, it's going to be a stretch. When it comes to changing how you deal with your relationships, it's going to be a stretch. 
When it comes to the patience, when it comes to persecution, when it comes to married home, changing your home, changing your marriage, becoming the man of God you ought to be, becoming the woman of God you ought to be, becoming the son you ought to be, becoming the daughter you ought to be, reacting properly to your mother, reacting properly to your father, all of these things, God is confronting you with his truth, with his love, and he wants to stretch you into the image of Christ. If you're like these men and you can't stretch, there's going to be a rupture. They, they were confronted with all this and they still wouldn't surrender their prejudices. Their prejudices were more precious to them than the obvious manifestation of God and his power and his truth. When you are confronted with God's way and God's light and God's truth, it'll do two things, one of two things. Either it will stretch you and mold you and change you into the image of Christ, or it will harden you and eventually cause a rupture. In life, there's a lot of things. When it comes to turning the other cheek, when it comes to how I respond when I'm being corrected or instructed, when it comes to me getting the dirty job, when it comes to submission, when it comes to responding to a froward master, when it comes to the baby crying at midnight, when it comes to misunderstandings, false accusations, when it comes to helping the needy when it's inconvenient or sacrifice on your part, when it comes to changing religious norms and ideas that you've always held and prided yourself in, all of these things are going to be a stretch. Well, let's finish the chapter, and then I got some more to say on that subject. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. What does that mean? That means he went everywhere confronting society with God. Those who could adjust and stretch and submit and surrender and be changed could be converted. But Jesus said to them at one time, well, has Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites? These people draw near to me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And they teach for doctrines and commandments of men. Their heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they've closed, and their ears they've closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and be changed, converted, changed, and I should heal them. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, Harvest, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. The world is dying from false information, deception, ignorance, and poor judgment. All of these sheep scattered abroad, having no shepherd, were in Judaism. They had rabbis and priests. They had the temple. They had the synagogues. So what was the problem? The problem is they are not helped by a misrepresentation of God. They are not helped by a false gospel. God wants his children to demonstrate his ways to the needy world. That means if you cannot stretch and change and conform to Christ in every way, you have nothing to give. Amen? If you cannot be stretched and molded and your mind can't be changed, you really have nothing to offer this lost, dying world. They will be just like this, sheep, Having no shepherd scattered abroad. You say, well, we got churches on every corner. We got Bible all, Bibles all over the place. And they're still sheep scattered abroad like they have no shepherd. Why? Because you're not giving them what they need. 
America's got lots of Christian radio stations, conferences, all sorts of things. And it is going to pot. Morally a wreck. Until I am willing to be broken and remade a new wineskin. I cannot carry God's love and truth to the world because I can't stretch myself. These, these, these religious leaders, they weren't drunks and pimps. And I mean, they were religious leaders. They studied the Torah. They were disciples of the Torah, the Tanakh. What was the problem? The problem is this. Do you really think that you will ever get to the point where when confronted with God, there's nothing to change? Do you really think that when confronted with God's perspective on this or that or everything, that you really have, will have nothing to change? No adjustment to make? You think you, you, think you can, you can uh, tell you're already conformed to the image of Christ? Really? Or do you expect to be continually growing changing, stretching. And when you're being stretched, you say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. When you're sweating and you're grieving, do you say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Do you really want to be all God wants you to be? You know, oftentimes we've said of uh, converts, that people who've come to the church, they've joined the church, and yet it, you wonder if they're really on board. And I've told my family many times, we will take them as far as they're willing to go. That's been our strategy. We are growing. I know a lot of families that if they had stayed on track and just followed and stuck with us in our stretching, we were being stretched. We were being changed. But if they'd have stuck with us and stretched with us, they'd be in so much better shape now than they are where they're at. And I could name many, and many of you know, some you don't know. How far are you going to stretch? Let's stand together. I'm with heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around. This is so, so important. It's huge. All through this chapter, we have seen those like Matthew. We've seen those like Jairus. Those who are willing to forget what all their friends thought, what everybody thought, and they were willing to come to Jesus and be stretched and have victory. And then we see those who simply could not stretch. All they could do is criticize. Based on what? Based on their assumptions that they were already right. So they couldn't learn anymore. They couldn't grow. I wonder who in here this morning would say, Dear Lord, I testify before Brother Mark, before the Lord, when who would say, I want God to stretch me just as far as I need to stretch so that I could be conformed to the image of Christ in every way. And that new wine could fill me up and both would be preserved. God, make me a new wineskin. This all goes together with learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. God, help me to get everything in right perspective. Help me not to be caught up in some ceremony and forget what's really going on. 
How many of you raise your hand as a testimony? God, stretch me just as far as it need be to be fully conformed to Christ. It doesn't matter what or where. God, stretch me. I want to be stretchable. Thank you. I see hands up everywhere. Thank you. God bless you. I would hope that every hand was raised. I didn't get a chance to count. You can put your hand down. Brothers and sisters, you don't know what the narrow road holds this next year. If you're going to stay on the narrow way all the way, if you're going to fight a good fight, if you're going to keep the faith, if you're going to finish your course, you can read and see how Paul was stretched so many times, and you only see what you can see. There were inner stretches. There were many stretches you you can't even see in Paul's life. But I'm going to say to you, you start solidifying on your opinions and ideas and start criticizing instead of learning. You're going to rupture instead of grow. I want you to commit before God Almighty that you want to be stretchable in every way that's needed in your life before God. Heavenly Father, and as I'm, as I'm praying for you, if you feel the need to come forward and kneel at an altar and do business with God, or go to a prayer room, or seek counsel, you feel free to do whatever God leads you to do right now, as I pray. Heavenly Father, you know the needs in each family here. You know the needs in each heart and life. You know the needs in my life. We have seen so clearly the frustration the sparks, the friction, when God tried to teach his own people his love, his way, his truth. And there were so many who could not be changed. They could not be convinced. They could not be stretched. Eventually, they ruptured. Abba, Father. Oh, help us never become that way. Father, I give my heart and mind to you. I want you to stretch me to reach the lost in whatever way is appropriate. It doesn't matter whether I like tax collectors or not. It doesn't matter whether I consider this proper protocol God, help us to learn what you want us to learn. We don't want to compromise truth and righteousness. The stretching of God never does that. The stretching of God makes us more holy, more righteous, more productive, more like Christ, not less. But Father, there may be some things that we think would not please you, that really would please you. Peter would have never dreamed of going and preaching the gospel to Gentiles until you stretched him. Oh, Lord, teach us. Teach us, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Remain standing for prayer, if you would. I'd like to ask the brethren to go ahead and and pray, and then I will pray again before communion.